What do kids need as they're growing up? Think about this for a second. I want you to come up with two or three things in your mind, and maybe an easier way to process that would be to think about what did you need, lest I remind everyone in this room that at one point we were a kid. And so what did you need when you were growing up as a kid? In the West, so in Western culture, there's been this grand experiment, if you will, over, especially over the last hundred years, but really it started kind of in the 1600s, with this idea of the nuclear family. And for thousands and thousands of years, humans had been deeply embedded within a broader net of community life and experiencing family in a broader sense, right, in their social network, in their faith, in their work. But then what happened was we kind of shed this idea of community and and embrace this concept called the nuclear family, which basically is that in your family, so parents and kids, you can have and experience everything that you need. And what happened in the middle of that was it, it had this huge impact on us as people and in regards to parenting as well. That we have, What we've done is we've created this idea that parents are required to have all the skills, all the techniques, and all the strategies to raise perfect kids on their own. How's that going for you? And, and I would argue in some ways that what's unfortunate about what's happened in our culture is that we've kind of gotten in this idea of we're just going to try to figure this out on our own, and when we're super, super, super desperate, then maybe we'll reach out. And our proposition for you guys today is that is it not only is it important and maybe one of the best ways for us to raise kids, but... Kids need to be raised in the family of grace, in the community of God, and parents need to parent in the family of grace and in the community of God. You know, Luke chapter 2 is this exposition, if you will, of what Jesus' life was like growing up. It was a very different culture. It was kind of this ecumenical culture where people helped each other. It was a, they lived in this family dynamic, right? And so... Uh, you know, Luke chapter 2 recounts when Jesus went to the temple and his parents didn't realize he was gone because he was with the rest of the family because the family relied on each other to help raise. And we see Jesus grew up in a community where family was valued, but everyone was a part of this broader family. And so over the next three weeks, what we want to talk about is how to create a culture of flourishing for our kids. How do we create a culture of flourishing for our kids? And and today what we want to talk about is how the Bible invites us to reestablish a broader view of family. So today we're going to talk about a broader view of family. Next week we're going to talk about cultivating grace as part of the culture. And then how those two things really help create a place of flourishing for our kids and what that looks like. So again, because no no matter if you are single, if you're married, excuse me, if you're a grandparent, if you're married and don't have kids, we all need to grow in our gospel mindset of what a family is. And that mindset says that when we come to faith in Christ, our need brings us into a brand new family. And Galatians chapter 3, 28 describes this family. Paul's talking about kind of the uniqueness of what this family will be like. And he says, in this family, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And what, Jesus, what Paul's doing here is he's trying to say, like he's painting this beautiful picture of what happens in Christ, is that... you. In Christ, when we come to faith in Christ, it's not just this personalized thing that we all experience. We're, we're so prone to talk about Christianity just in this, when you pray this prayer, you will be saved and you will experience forgiveness of sins. And those are all true things. But 
But what happens in, a, in this incredibly beautiful part of it is that we become now a part of this family of other people who are also a part of this place, not because they have it all together, they have it all figured out, because they're a male or a female, they're black or white, they're a Jew or Greek, they're young or they're old. No, no, no. Anyone who puts their faith in Jesus is now a child of God and a part of this family where everyone is welcome and everyone is needed. You know, one of the reasons I think we struggle in our Christian walk is because we try to do it alone. We try to do it alone. So why do we need the family of God? <clears throat> well, because it's here where we can engage with each other in the grand story of the gospel that is working itself out in all of our lives. And, and church, what we believe is that when we engage with kids, when we engage with those who are young, when we welcome them into the family of grace, not only will we help them encounter the gospel, but will help them observe how the gospel is changing us. Hear that again, because this is really important, what I'm trying to say here, that basically we want kids to feel so welcome in our family because part of what happens in that is they get to encounter the family of God and its beauty and then in our lives see the gospel story at work in us. So this morning we want to start by talking about what it is that kids really need like that foundational aspect of what they need. Because when we do, we'll discover how engaging our kids will increase not only their experience of the gospel, but our experience of the gospel. So we're going to start by talking about what kids need, and then we're going to jump to some really practical steps of how we, as a church family, can work towards grow in, process, build, grow in process here towards building a family of grace. Um, so before Brian and I had our first child, Darby, um, I had had very little experience with children. I had rarely babysat, and I didn't feel prepared at all to parent or care for a child. And so I reached out to my community at the time for some resources, and sadly, the resource I was provided with um, was a book, and so I read this book very diligently uh, because I was desperate and, and really needed to know how to, how to be a good mom, and so I sought to apply these principles diligently, um, but then after years after going to grad school and counseling, um, I learned why these principles that were espoused in this book were really probably not the best for my child child, excuse me, um, or for me in being able to create the bond with my daughter that I really wanted to, um, because the principles were kind of these harsh guidelines about how to keep your child on a, a really strict schedule, and it was hard and difficult, um, but I relied on that information because that's what I had at the time, right, and so, you know, probably some of my daughter's, some of her present day struggles, even with anxiety, are likely somewhat related to me trying to follow these kind of harsh guidelines. Um, and s instead of really being able to lean into learning about myself as a mom and learning my unique daughter and her needs. Um, and so obviously this, uh, you know, goes into my deep insecurities and fears that drove me to kind of trust this resource above all else, right? And this kind of highlights some of the ways that our best parenting attempts can kind of come from places of fear and insecurity, often kind of leading us in the wrong direction. And so since then, I've had many opportunities to study and learn um, and more kind of evidence-based research on attachment and parenting and children's needs. And interestingly, as Christians, in my opinion, um, we have beautiful examples from God about how he treats us as a father um, in, in connecting with our kids, right? And that, unfortunately, I wasn't guided to tap into those when I was a young mom. Um, but I really love when the science of psychology and theology intersect. That's something that's really exciting for me. And I recently read a book that beautifully highlights this intersection and kind of identifies from a scientific perspective, right, the, 
the five primary needs of kids for secure attachment. And these needs are likely not going to be unfamiliar to you. In fact, um, uh, you know, they're being from a Christian perspective, we're probably, a lot of you are going to be like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Sure, you didn't really have to spend a whole sermon on that. But the reason we want to highlight these is because to encourage us to really think about, like Brian was saying, how were, how did, were these needs met for me as a child? Because really, like, it, sometimes we're still longing for those needs to be met for ourselves. Um, and then second, how am I meeting those child's, how, how am I meeting those needs for my child or others, right? And um, when we think about that, when we think about the broader family, we really want to encourage us to think about, like, we aren't just meeting those needs for our children. We're trying to meet those needs for each other, right? Um, okay, so I'm going to dive into these five needs, and um, hopefully they will be of interest to you. But So the five primary needs of children. The first one is felt safety and protection. And so parents who provide, like, a secure base for their children, um, they, they are fiercely protective and not overprotective, right? So with this, um, our children know that we are there for them and to try and keep themselves safe from harm as best we can, right? Um, and this could be as simple as, like, tucking them in at night, right, when to let them know that they're safe when they go to sleep or letting them know that we're going to pick them up from school or from an activity, right? Just that they know they can depend on us and that we're going to be there for them. Um, and this kind of, this one kind of typically comes kind of naturally for us. Um, and in most cases, we have to probably, in our situations, be a little more careful that we're not overprotective of our kids um, rather than protective of them. But I think that's a really important one. Then I think all for all these, the key here is really that word felt. So the, the, it's not that you're not doing it, but making sure that your child feels it um, is definitely the, the most important part of that. Um, number two is feeling seen and known. So this can kind of involve trying to give voice to our best estimate of what our kids emotions, needs, motivations, and ideas are, right? Um, it can be helpful when noticing our child's reactions to just start with curiosity, right? Um, with young children, this could look like, did that make you mad or did that make you sad? And kind of asking them those questions. Naming what they might be feeling can kind of help them understand their emotions. Um, and then this can get a little bit more nuanced and also difficult as our children age and their emotional worlds start to expand, right? And so then we want to kind of have a more tentative approach to their, their feelings and emotions. But I think a guess, even a guess, can be a good start to a conversation as long as we kind of give them room to kind of correct us, right, when we don't get it right with them. Um, and if we're able to connect with our kids in their emotions, we are more likely to help them feel seen and known, right? And um, I love to see how this psychological text names this need, feeling deeply seen and known. And that's so much of what we talk about, right, in our relationship with God is how he sees us and he knows us, how he sees our hurts and our pain, and he knows us so intimately that he joins with us in our emotions. And so that's kind of really all this is for us, too, as parents is, um, or friends, right, or coworkers, is we're trying to join with someone else in what they're experiencing. Um, then the third one is felt, again, keyword, felt um, comfort and reassurance. And when we talk about this, obviously it's related to kind of joining and connecting with someone emotionally is to then offer some consistent soothing and reassurance um, as parents, and that this contributes over time to our child's ability to be able to regulate their own emotions, right? So when we are there for them um, and connect with them, and if we help kids name what they're feeling and then offer support, soothing, and comfort, this helps them to kind of return to a calm and more stable state, right? Um, this could be physical touch, but it doesn't always include that because kids differ on their preferences of being, what feels soothing to them. Um, you know, sometimes 
I have clients who tell me, like, my husband will just, like, pat me on the shoulder when I'm crying and that that annoys me, right? Why did, <laughs> like, yeah. So it's not always soothing. You have to think about, like, what is the person like? And that's part of getting to know whether it's your spouse or your child or your friend, what is comforting to them. Um, and then sometimes just letting them know um, that by telling them, like, that makes sense or I get it or I'm sorry you're going through this can go a long way in, in kind of offering that soothing. And so these are, it's really not, Brian was saying this before in the car, he's like, it's really not rocket science. I'm like, not, no, right? But doing these things um, requires us, right, to, to stop, slow down, and enter into someone else's world. And that can be hard for us when we're so used to just going at a fast pace in our own world. And then the fourth one is, and I just love this one, is... Um, feeling or felt valued and ex expressed delight. So when a child can count on parents to show delight in who they are, the experience of being valued and valuable emerges, right? So then that's where the kid feels like they're valuable themselves, right? So when I ask clients, like, who delighted in you when you were a kid, I typically get some pretty blank stares, right? And the reason is probably because a lot of people don't really feel like they were delighted and they don't feel like they were valued. Um, and we as people can struggle here because we fear that making our kids, you know, prideful or giving them a big head if we kind of delight in them or celebrate them. So um, the switch here or the shift can kind of come from instead of over focusing on the things that they do well which is great like it's great to celebrate your kids accomplishments right but to also kind of like celebrate who they are as a person you know you're such a hard worker or your smile lights up the room or i just see you as like a kind-hearted person speaks a little bit deeper into not just their performance or what they do but to who they are as a person um, and they need to hear that from especially from us right um and then the last one is felt support for best self. So this is kind of similar, but um, an unconditional support and encouragement. And this can actually, I think, be a tough one for us because supporting our child's best self often means not having an agenda. Right? So that means that um, our preconceived expectation of who our child should be, we kind of sometimes have to let go of that. Um, and sometimes that can be a lot harder for us than we think. But So this means really shifting into seeing ourselves as like co-explorers with our kids, supporters of who they are as a unique person and helping get to know them and helping them get to know themselves in that. And so um, so as we seek to help meet these, these needs in our kids, we can ask ourselves these questions, you know, did, did I feel protected as a kid? Did I feel seen? Did I feel comforted? Did I feel valued? Did I feel supported? Um, and to think about that in terms of like what our comfort level might be in offering other people and our kids that um, in, in our relationship with them. And then, you know, we also can really think about these gaps in our own needs and how they were met or not met and in our relationship with God, right? As our Father, we have a beautiful opportunity to feel those things in our relationship with him, which um, I'm not going to lie, is easier said than done and is not like a magic wand thing that we just do. Um. And just to build off of that, I think as we were going through this, we, we started going through this a few weeks ago and thinking about this part, you know, I would love for you guys in this moment, let's just pause for just a second here and to look at those five needs and I want you to consider how you experience those in your relationship with God. Like, just, just take a moment here. Let's just pause for just a second, because this is kind of where we're going with this, right? Is, is that, Donner said, like, is, how cool is it that some scientists said, this is what kids need? And then when you look at that list, you go, the place where we're going to feel that at its most foundational level, in its most purest level, right? Pure, perfect protection, perfectly being seen and known, perfectly being reassured and comforted, perfectly being valued, perfectly being supported. 
So I, I, I kind of want, I, I want to ask you if you can in, in a, to allow in this moment here the Holy Spirit to just, where is it that you, <laughs> I mean, we're all kids at heart, right? Take a moment here and just let God say to you, this is, this is what you can find in my relationship with you. Because I think the principle that plays out for all of us in this is that um, what really is going to be one of the most fundamental ways that we're able to offer that to kids is when we're encountering that with our Heavenly Father. And as we're experiencing in Him safety being known, being protected, being reassured, being valued, being delighted in, being supported, when we're experiencing that in our relationship with Him is when that then overflows into our relationship with our kids. And what we're trying actually to encourage us as a church to think about this morning is actually that this is a call for all of us that any kid that's in this room right now, my daughter Aubrey, 16, right? I want her to experience you who are encountering this in God's presence to then be a picture of those things to her. And I believe that as a body of Christ, as a, this is why we use the word family of grace. What's our mission? To be a family of grace that it doesn't matter who you are in this room, every single kid that comes running through this church needs to experience the gospel story this way from all of us. It's kind of the, the mission that God calls the family of Christ to be in. We were having our cohort this week, and one... Uh, our preaching cohort, and we were talking about this, and what somebody was sharing about, I believe it was Janet, was sharing, sharing how what she remembers about growing up is the people. Like, not so much the Sunday school lessons, although, yes, not so much the sermons, and the, but, but the people who cared about her and that she saw the gospel story in. And I, I love that picture. I think this is kind of what we're inviting us as a church to consider is that, like to say, hey, yeah, we want when kids grow up to look back and say, well, that thing at the summit, it was, I don't know what it was, but I, I can't maybe express it like this. I can't say that, oh, yeah, well, let me tell you, I felt delighted in, and I felt, but maybe they could, right? What would happen if that's what we were, because we were encountering God that way that we were then able to help kids do that? And so we want to talk now just quickly about, some practical ways to do this. I mean, we're talking to, I think what's a little overwhelming for me in this sermon, just to be honest with you guys, is we are trying to think about building a church family that doesn't operate in a way where we're all just these tiny little silos, where we're saying, hey, let's, let's really think about how we can support one another. And if you're um, grown and have been through seeing kids grow up, then we desperately need you to invest in other parents in this room that are struggling, because we all are. And if, if you can't have kids, that we desperately need you to come alongside and encourage, and that, that we all need each other in this, right? That, that this is kind of the point. And so to try to break out of our silos where we live alone trying to follow God that we would say, no, I, I, I'm recognizing that I'm not experiencing the fullness of the gospel unless I'm in community. And what we're also calling us to then is to be a place where we can help our kids experience that as well. So we thought of two practical things that go alongside with what this looks like, where we can cultivate a broader view of family. And so the first thing is to come alongside. Uh, to just come alongside parents in our church, come alongside kids in our church. So one way to cultivate a broader understanding of family is by participating in the development of children, by paying more attention to those who need support in our body. And when we consider how maybe it isn't in our best interest to have one or two parents primarily raising kids, then as the broader church family, we get outside of ourselves and we say, how can we come alongside? How can we support others? 
And so we heard of a, a small group from another church, actually, which there was this, a single mom and was, had a child that had some behavioral issues and was struggling. And this community group, in this really beautiful way, it was actually a specific family, said, uh, we're, gonna, we're just going to come alongside this mom and just encourage her. And so they asked her, could we, would you be okay if your child came and just hang, hung out with us once a week? We play games once a week. We just want to invite your child to come be with us. And for this mom, it was like this beautiful picture of like, having some rest, being able to have someone else pour into and care about, invest in their kid, acknowledging the need that she had, and then <clears throat> pouring into this child. And I think that sounds maybe simple, but like, isn't that so hard too, right? They were like, ah, wait, Brian, I'm so selfish. I don't have any time in my life to invest in anybody. Um, I, I'm saying that about myself, but I think the, the beauty of the gospel, what it does for us is it reminds us, hey, I'm experiencing these beautiful things in my relationship with God. And he, he wants us to be a display, to bring that to others. And in the family of God is one of the greatest places where we can display that to others. And so we would encourage, I would encourage you, I'd ask you to consider how you could come alongside someone in our church family Maybe today, maybe next week, sometime this year, just that you would pray and consider that. What if we think more broadly and creatively about how we can come alongside parents? And, and another way to cultivate that broader view of being intentional in, in kids' lives, you know, this isn't just a plea to work on Sunday mornings, although we really super appreciate everybody who's investing in our kids on Sunday mornings. Um, but some of you are also supporting our college students by sending them care packages, which I have a college student, so I know she super, super appreciates that and feels very loved by that. And then some of you are already working with kids on a daily basis in our community, which is awesome. Um, I heard a really beautiful story about a paramedic who was on a call recently um, in a family who, um, there was a child in the family, but the, there was a family member who needed medical attention and this of course was very distressing to this child and so this paramedic got down on the child's level and the child was clearly anxious and he helped her do some deep breathing and just talk softly to her and when the call was over his partner was like man how did you learn to do that like what how and he was like asking him about it he was like blown away by it and he said Oh, he told him, oh, I learned that in my counseling, um, and this is the way, you know, that I, I learned how to calm myself down. So I just got on this kid's level and helped her do that, and um, it really got this guy's attention. And so I think that's really cool. Just small little examples in our world how he didn't ignore that child and, and really saw her as a human being who just needed a few minutes of attention. And and I think also this is obviously the way that Jesus approached children, right? Like he let them crawl on him and interact with them so personally that his disciples became pretty anxious about it, right? And they were like, hey, should we tell these kids to beat it, right? And he's like, no, I, I, I want to be with them, you know. Um, and I, I want to be like that. I want to be like, let the children come to me. I'm a little bit more like, let the children go away from me, right? Like, <laughs> Because they're messy and they're complicated. I don't really know. Like, you know, I learned how to parent sort of my own kids. But kids in general, I'm a little bit like, well, what do you want? How do I interact with you? So I totally get that personally. Um, because kids are a lot, right? Um, but this is an area that we, we, I need to grow in. And, and we probably, a lot of us need to grow in. But to let the children come to me. And what would it look like if we seek that attitude this year in, with children in our world, right? And, and, to, and especially in our broader summit family. Right? Yeah, some things that are neat about that are happening that you're seeing, like one thing is, you know, we did VBS this last year and we were able to, we had a Sunday where the kids were up on stage leading us in worship, right? That's part of it. 
Uh, Ethan is a senior in high school, and he's leading us in worship every week. There's something beautiful about seeing that happen. And, and just to say it more bluntly from, from my side, like I love it when kids are in the sanctuary during the services. I think there's something extremely beautiful about it. I love it when they're noisy and they cry. And, that, and you guys are like, liar. And I, but no, I, I, I want you to hear that. I mean that sincerely. Like There's something about the beauty of us being that picture of a family, right? There's extreme value. I mean, we deeply value having kids programming where we can pour into our kids and have intentional experiences for them. But at the same time, it's great to have kids in here as well. And we're thinking about that as a church. Like, what does it look like for us to watch kids worship and watch them follow Jesus in that way? You know, there's a reason why, it's interesting, why when we do kids programs, do, is it packed in here? Right? Right? I am a, deep, a little bit offended by that, right? Brian's <laughs> preaching this Sunday. Oh, Brian, it's fine. We don't need to go hear him. But, oh, the kids are singing? Mary had a little lamb? Oh, let's go. I'm so excited, right? The, 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 but, but why? But think. I mean, I'm being silly. But I think we all know, like, we want to be supportive. We want to be encouraged. We love the simplicity. And why, that's why Jesus said, let the kids come to me. And so this message that we're doing this morning, it's a call to us all. It really is a challenge to say, let's ask God to, to explode our minds about what the family of grace looks like. And let's be thankful for our kids. Let's pray for our kids. Let's come alongside parents. Let's be intentional in creating a culture and a place where when kids grow up in 20, 30 years, they'll be able to look back and say, yeah, I, I experienced the gospel of grace in that place. And I can't exactly tell you how maybe, but uh, people just loved me well and I felt valued and delighted. And uh, Dave, can you put back that slide with the five, um, the five needs there? Uh, thanks. <clears throat> so, just to kind of conclude, um, wherever you are today, can I just remind you that Jesus broke into this world so that you could experience that? That all of your deepest needs. We started this sermon by asking, what do kids need and what do you need? And I would venture to say that for all of us, we would have come up, if we got down in on some of them, to want something on that list. And Jesus breaks into our world to say, I will give you what you need. I will give you what you need. C come and follow me. And the beauty of his family is he says, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring you into this family. And guess what's going to happen there? It's going to be messy because it's a bunch of other people that need those things too. But I'm going to help you experience those things there. So, so enter into that family. Be a part of that family. Value others in that family. Be intentional. Come alongside. All these things that we said. And let's let the gospel transform us. You know, to be of this part of this family, we don't need to have all of our stuff together. You don't need to do this perfectly, um, but let's trust the Spirit of God to help us literally become a family of grace. Let's pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, we thank you this morning for Jesus, and uh, we come before you in this moment with our needs, and we confess to you that we, we need those things. <laughs> And so would you help us experience you first and foremost as the one who comes into our lives, to, who delights in us, who supports us, who encourages us, who values us, who, who creates a place of safety and refuge. Father, may our testimony of who Jesus is be more and more evident of what those needs are that we have, that we would find them met in him. And Father, in the midst of all that, then we pray.
that you would help us express those, how we're finding joy in Christ to one another and invite others into that and especially kids into that and you, that you would help us be a true picture of a family of grace until we get to come together into the ultimate family with you for eternity. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.